So this is basically Dungeon Meshy. It is a wild fantasy story that follows a group of characters with crackhead energy, and I absolutely love it. And this is probably what you thought it would be when you saw the trailers and saw manga fans talking about it. But there's more than just laughs in this show, and that's already pretty clear in episode one. Which is why, as someone who's watching the series for the very first time, I want to share my unbiased reaction, why I think there's nothing quite like this series, and why I think it's worth watching every week. Now, like I said, I've never read the manga, but I had always seen manga fans praising Dungeon Meshi, or Delicious in Dungeon, for how funny it is. But I was surprised when I started episode 1 and the opening was actually pretty intense. It starts by setting up the world building, which I want to save for later in the video, but basically this is a typical fantasy world where there's some kind of lost civilization that's trapped at the bottom of this dungeon. So adventurers and all kinds of other brave people start to delve into the many levels of the dungeon in hopes of discovering this lost civilization. That is the setup for the main characters who, when we meet them, have managed to reach one of the deeper levels and are now fighting a massive dragon. Naturally, the dragon is really strong, and because of the fact that they've been exploring for a long time, they're all tired and hungry and end up losing the fight. One of the members of the party gets eaten by the dragon, but before she's eaten, she seems to cast a spell that sends her friends back outside so they can escape. Now, feeling totally defeated, the characters need to go back into the dungeon with no money and no supplies in hopes of saving her before it's too late. Like I said, this is a fairly intense way to start the story. It's nice because you're set up to believe that it's all laughs and then it opens like this. So with that kind of twist, it sort of helps you to get invested early on before they really layer on the comedy. All in all, they do a nice job of setting up the world without throwing too much at you right away. And this scene in particular does a nice job of setting up the characters that come to form the main cast and showing us their motivation. Because as the story goes on and they go through all these gags, you would feel like it's just a gag series if it weren't for the fact that there's actually a pretty serious plot. It's at this point, once we have the motivation, that we start to really get into the characters that carry this story. But before I explain who they are, make sure to like the video if you're enjoying it so far. It's the easiest way to support the channel, and it helps spread the video to other viewers like you. Now, like I said, these characters carry this story, and part of that is because their roles are pretty clearly defined right away. First is the leader of the party, Laos. His sister, Fallon, is the one who got eaten by the dragon and you can kind of tell what kind of character he's going to be right away. He's the leader of the party. He's very tactical, always talking about the party and what they have and what they need to do next. And he's got this big armor that makes him look like a captain. So you get the impression that he's a pretty serious dude, which he is. But then when the characters are like, hey, we need food, and then they're like, food costs money. So then they're like, hey, we need money. Leos comes out and says, hey, what if we just like eat the monsters we kill? Which at first seems like a very rational, very economical thing to do. You know, the dad friend thing to do. But then he keeps bringing it up again and again until the other characters are like, um, hey man, it's cool with us, but are you sure you don't just really want to see what monsters taste like? So of course he admits that in fact he kinda sort of maybe really just wants to try eating monsters because of this book he read. So at this point you begin to understand that while very serious, Leos is also a massive dork. Like for example, at one point one of the characters gets trapped by this plant monster and she's like, help me before I get eaten. And Leos is like, oh no no no, that's the man-eating plant. This plant just plants leech seeds under your skin. Like, totally misses the point, but because he's a friggin' nerd, he's gonna point out the difference. And then when they save her, Leos is like, so how do you feel? She's like, oh, you know, I'm all right. But then he's like, no, 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 no. This is a rare predator that dangles its prey with its vines. What was that experience like? Now, of course, this character is pissed, but that's just the dynamic of Leos. Now, this other character is Marseille. And again, I don't read the manga, but based on the reactions from manga fans, my understanding is that she's basically the best character in the series. And I'm not gonna lie, I kind of agree. Marseille is your typical elf mage. And like any sensible person, she thinks the idea of eating creepy crawlies is absolutely disgusting. So in this series, she's somewhat of a self-insert. Because whenever the characters decide to eat their next monster, Marcel is the one to be like, uh, yeah, I'm not eating a mushroom with legs. Or she'll be like, um, did you just get those spices from a graveyard? While everyone else seems ready to eat troll feet and spider eyes, Marcel is the only one exercising some prudent skepticism. Of course, she always seems to be punished for it, whether it be one of her hilarious reactions or something more intense like getting attacked by plant monsters. Naturally, you can see why she might be a fan favorite. 
Now, you also have the other two characters, Chilchuck and Senshi. Senshi is your typical dwarf character. Big beard, older looking, and he's good with crafts. He's got more experience than the other members of the party, so whenever they decide to cook up a new dish, Senshi is usually the one that tells them how to do it. Then you have Chilchuck. Now, Chilchuck is a funny case because at first I thought he was just a young human. But then I was like, okay, small, has big ears, he's a rogue, sounding an awful lot like a halfling. And what do you know, when I looked him up on the wiki, I found out he's a half foot. So, you know, tomato tomato. Aside from that, Chilchuck seems to be the straight man of the group. He's the one to call Laos out for his weird monster kink. He's usually calling out Marcel for whatever crackhead nonsense she's getting into. That's more or less his dynamic so far. And speaking of dynamics, this is why these characters work so well. First of all, they are instantly recognizable. Laos stands out as the serious leader. Marcel and Senshi are obviously an elf and a dwarf and fit into those archetypes. And it's pretty easy to figure out that Chilchuck is a half-foot, or halfling for D&D and Lord of the Rings fans. So the story gives you these characters that you're already pretty familiar with, but then builds on that with their respective gags. Now, one would think that this would hurt the story, because in this age of anime, there are so many gag series and there's a myriad of fantasy series. So you would think because the series has so many tropes, it would just melt into the huge mess of fantasy anime that are already out. But obviously, this isn't the case. This is because Dungeon Meshi gives you a world that feels familiar because of the common tropes and gags, but then ramps them up in order to develop its own unique personality. So for example, Laos seems like the overly serious hero, but then as the story goes on, we see that he's clearly just going to get nerdier and nerdier. Same thing with Marcel as well. The more monsters they try to eat, the more we see Marcel freak out and we see what kind of character she really is. So, the story has plenty of personality, and it feels like the many fantasy stories we've seen before it. And this translates to the world building as well. Like I said before, the story doesn't throw a ton at you in the beginning. But over the course of episode 1, you learn a great deal about this world and the kinds of people that inhabit it. You have the village on the surface. That's where it's safest. Then you have the sort of lobby of the dungeon. This is where everyone rests and meets up before they delve into the dungeon. As a result, people use this area as a marketplace for goods and services between adventurers. Then below the lobby are the many levels of the dungeon that naturally get more and more dangerous as one gets closer and closer to that legendary cursed civilization. And among these levels, as Laos points out later on, there is a broad ecosystem of monsters that live off of the environment that exists in the dungeon. Now, is this a revolutionary premise? Of course not. One could argue that it shares a lot in common with Monster Hunter, but it borrows from the tropes that we all know well in a way that allows it to tell its own story. It feels familiar, but as this story goes on, we begin to learn how this world is different one small detail at a time. And there are plenty of details in this anime, from the backgrounds to the characters, right down to the food they eat that serves as even more anime cooking ASMR. On that note, it's definitely worth mentioning Studio Trigger's contributions to this anime. Now, obviously, I haven't read the manga, so I can't speak to the anime and manga differences. But one thing I noticed right away is that this doesn't look like the usual Trigger anime. I mean, it doesn't look like Kill a Kill, and it certainly doesn't look like Cyberpunk. The animation is obviously just as great as any of their other projects, and the characters do have that rounded out sort of look, but the characters don't have that sort of loose style animation that they usually do in a Trigger anime. As a result, while it's clearly different from the manga, Trigger animates Dungeon Meshi in a way that makes it look more like the source material than any of its other projects. Manga readers can tell me if I'm wrong, which I'm sure they will since this is the internet, but to me it seems like Trigger is pretty faithful to the manga and its art style. On that note, I'm really excited to see how the story will develop and how Trigger will continue to adapt the manga. Again, haven't read the manga, so I have no idea where the story is going or whether any of my first impressions hold any weight. But here's what I am looking forward to and why. Dungeon Meshi is clearly a very silly series. It's goofy, but it knows how to have simple, silly fun. And a large part of this is the characters and how they carry the story with their chemistry and their gags. 
Now, obviously these gags are somewhat tropey, so I'm looking forward to seeing how these character dynamics evolve over time. Because right now the characters are mostly defined by their tropes. But with a story as deceptively clever as this one, I have a sneaking suspicion that this group will see some solid character development. Naturally, I'm also looking forward to how the plot evolves as well. Because right now it's, hey, here's all this gag comedy, and oh, by the way, we have to go save Fallon. I'm curious to see how fast they reach that goal, how it changes the story, and where they go from there. I'm also curious to see how the world evolves, because we've got a familiar yet unique premise. So now I want to see how they build on that and continue to make this series stand out from the thousands of other fantasy anime. Overall, I'm in love with Dungeon Meshi already. The characters are awesome, the story is hilarious, and I'm invested in this world. So, I'm planning on watching each episode every week to see how the series evolves over time. And it's for these reasons, and more, that I think everyone else should do the same. But now I'd like to hear what you think. What did you think of episode 1? If you've read the manga, what did you think of my first impressions? Share your thoughts and see what everyone else has to say down in the comments. I'll pick my favorite and share it as comment of the week on my community tab. And if you'd like another discussion like this one, then check out my recent video on Shangri-La Frontier. In that video, I explain why that anime completely changes how you play video games. You can find it in the playlist linked right here. Until then, thank you for watching, and I hope to hear from you soon.